let me just introduce our, our speaker today. So we have Leslie Granetta, who's an independent writer here in Cambridge, who has collaborated with an evolutionary biologist to understand spider silk. And the reason she's interested in spider silk is not because she's a crazy, crazy spider lady. But now I am. But now she <laughs> is. Uh, but because spiders turn out to be a great way of understanding the process of evolution and natural selection. So Leslie. I can hold um, up the book and show why, you. Why don't you tell us how you got interested in spiders? Um, how I got interested in spiders, I'm an English major. I have a master's in English. I have no f nothing past high school science which puts me at a big disadvantage in this room, I suspect. And, uh, <laughs> and what ha I was working for, I have written science articles for various alumni magazines, Tech Review, and a few, I wrote a kind of joke commentary on evolution, human evolution for NPR. And I had had a couple of NPR commentaries before, and they said they would take this commentary. It was all about how you unfortunately can't throw four-year-old kids into the pool and they just swim like dogs. And it, anyway, it, <laughs> um, whereas that's true about apes, but not about monkeys. So that's all interesting. So they told me that they would take the commentary if I got it vetted by a, an evolutionary scientist. And you know, I'm a freelancer. So I, of course, said, oh, yes, I will do that. And then it was like, hang up the phone. I was like, ah! I don't know any evolutionary scientists. How am I going to do this? My husband at the time worked at the late lamented Arthur D. Little. And he worked with somebody there. We had gone to brunch with them. And he said, what about Bob's wife? I think she's an evolutionary scientist. <laughs> so I called Bob's wife, Kay, who, Kay Craig, who's the co-author, Catherine L. Craig. Turns out that she did some really pioneering research on pioneering research on um, the evolution of spider silk. And she, um, she was nearly finished with her monograph, and she just needed it smoothed out a little bit. So I said that I would, um, I have a copy of her monograph over there if you want to see it. So, so I was copy editing her book, and I, there were part, parts of it I didn't understand. But what I suddenly realized was that although I thought I understood evolution, I mean, I had been reading the Science Times every Tuesday since it started publishing and all of that. Although I thought I understood evolution and natural selection, I realized that I had these very, very common misconceptions about evolution and natural selection. This was right at the time when um, in the whole intelligent design thing was really bubbling up. And uh, I realized reading her book that you could use spiders and the evolution of spider silk to explain the process of evolution and the process of natural selection to non-biologists in a way that would be extremely difficult to do with any other kind of organism. And I mean, I'll explain why. So this will end up being a little bit repetitive. But it's because the silks themselves are proteins. And since the 1990s, they've done genetic the genes behind some of these proteins. There's still a lot to go. But you know, it's very hard to figure out the genetic basis and the genetic evolution of, let's say, bird flight, right? Because it's very, very complicated. But what I'll show you when we get, when we get this going um, is that there's a sequential evolution of spider silks, silks that they still use now. And those can be you know, examined and characterized. And so you can actually see the genetic changes that lead to functional changes that then lead to you know, an increased chance of survival. So it turned out that, I mean, I thought it wouldn't take, me, take us very long to write this book. It ended up taking a lot longer than I thought it would because I, I had the hubris of most writers, which is I didn't know what I didn't know. So it, you know, I had to kind of school myself in evolutionary theory and proteomics and genetics. And, but anyway, it just turns out that spiders are this fantastic vehicle for explaining evolution to non-biologists. So that's the long story of how I got into this. So this kind of web, um, this is properly known as an orb web. And I would risk saying that when most people think of a spider web, this is the kind of spider web that they think of. 
Um, this one has been dusted with cornstarch so that it, usually when you see spider webs that you can really see like this, they've usually been dusted with some kind of powder so they can be photographed. Um, so to build an orb web, a uh, spider spins a number of different kinds of silk. So there's one kind of silk that's in the frame lines the, and the radial lines. Then they use a silk, a different kind of silk, to build a scaffold to help them build it. Then they eat that while they lay down a different kind of silk, which is this, the capture spiral. And then there are different kinds of silk proteins that are used, for instance, to anchor the lines, to anchor the lines to each other. And there's also a uh, glue, protein silk glue, that coats the capture line. And each of these silks is um, produced in a different silk gland in the spider. So pretty clearly, this is an amazing construction. Um, and as I said before, um, the book itself is about two things. One is the story of the evolution of spider silk. And I'm sorry, over there. Um, and the other one is, is an explanation of what natural selection really is and how it really works. Most people who are not you know, evolutionary biologists have a lot of misconceptions about that. And it turns out that spiders and their silks offer an unusually good view of this because the silks are proteins, um, and the pro proteins, all proteins, are dictated by genes. And with today's you know, research techniques, you can see how a change in a silk gene may lead to a change in silk protein structure. And you can, we can then see how the environment may favor um, one protein structure over another. So for instance, you can have a change in a silk gene that may result in a silk protein becoming stronger or stretchier or stickier. And the other thing is that now um, we're finding more and more not just how different spiders are related to each other. There are over 40,000 known species of spider. We can not only see how the species are related to each other, we can now see how the silk genes and the silk proteins are related to each other and descend from earlier genes and proteins. So what I'm going to show you today, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the deep gene and protein stuff, but we do go into it in the book. Um, but I'm going to show you some of the astounding uh, variety in the ways that spider silks and silk uses have evolved. So, you know, that orb web is pretty spectacular, but that's really, that's the least of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, when spiders' ancestors were evolving, they began evolving about 380 to 400 million years ago. When, back then, uh, plants, tallest plants were about this tall. Um, there were no birds, there were no mammals, there were no reptiles around, but there were plenty of very predatory arthropods. So arthropods, you probably know, are you know, spiders, insects, crustaceans, the things with jointed legs and exoskeletons. So if you were producing silk back then, what you might want the silk for is something like this. Uh, these are a type of spider called mesotheles. They belong to, there are three surviving major lineages of spiders. These belong to the oldest surviving lineage. They live only in Southeast Asia. They're pretty hard to find and pretty hard to study. Um, you can see, very interesting thing about them is that they have this uh, segmented, segmented abdomen, which other spiders don't. And that shows you their sort of, that shows you their ancestry. Um, and look how it's using silk. It has a burrow underground, where it, so it hides out from its predators in the burrow. It lines the burrow with silk, which helps hold the walls up. It also helps um, mediate um, humidity. It uses silk to knit together debris and create this flap-like trap door. So most of the time, it will be hiding in there and will actually be holding the door shut. So that defends it against its predators. Then this particular kind of species and a bunch of other ones set out these silk trip lines. And these are nocturnal, which also makes sense if you think of plants only being this tall, because there is very little shade. Um, what they do is they hang out on the edge of the burrow. They array their legs along the trip lines. And then when anything walks by and they feel the vibration, they lunge out, grab the prey with their fangs, and drag it back into the burrow and close the flap. And eat it. 
So there are about 90 species, 90 known species of these. As far as they're concerned, insects never evolved flight. They're, they're just fine in their burrows. So the second major lineage of spiders is known as the megalomorphs. Uh, the megalomorphs include the tarantulas and their closer relatives. The oldest known, oh, I should have said that this is very similar. These are like the coelacanths of the spider world. This is, they are very similar to um, fossil mesotheles from 290 million years ago. Um, the oldest megalomorph, megalomorph fossil is about 240 million years old. By then, do you have a, yep? Yeah, I was wondering whether as you go through uh, the various species, I assume there's going to be like a handful or something. Uh, I'd just be curious to know what proportion are actually poisonous. Like, are any of these poisonous? Well, it depends on what you mean by poisonous. They're all venomous, OK? So if you mean sort of medically, I think they call it medically interesting, or, <laughs> um, or medically significant. Um, very, very few spiders are medically significant. And it seems like the bulk of those are in Australia. <laughs> um, black widows are medically significant. Recluses, turns out, however, it turns out that most reported recluse bites are actually MRSA infections and not not spider bites. Spiders very, very rarely bite people. Most things that are reported as spider bites are not spider bites. OK, but you're saying that all these some chemicals don't paralyze or kill the prey. Exactly. Okay. For a long time, um, it was thought that these didn't have venom. Um, and so it was thought that that venom system evolved later but it, you know, this is one of these things where the better instrumentation you get changes knowledge um, with you know, much better, I think, electron microscopes or some kind, you know, some kind of imaging. Just last year, they discovered venom pores in the fangs of these. Um, so anyway, by the time that the megalomorphs evolved about two, 240 million years ago, they evolved before that, but that's the oldest fossil, there were tall plants. Um, there were climbing and flying insects, and there were also increasing numbers of amphibians and reptiles. And so in some of the oldest surviving branches of the megalomorphs, we see silkies like this. This is called a collar web. These are also nocturnal. This, so there's a silk-lined burrow under the ground. They build it up about an inch. They build the silk up, knit debris into it, and during the day, it's flexible. During the day, they close it shut, and then at night, they open it up and hang out here and wait to feel the vibration of their prey. So that's a collar web. This is a turret web. Similar, very similar idea, but maybe two, <laughs> two inches tall. Again, you see the debris knit into it. Um, so this, mostly it's defense from predators. But it actually, if you, you have to start. <laughs> I've become a bit adept at thinking at spider scale. You have to start seeing the world at spider scale. That's only about two inches tall, but compared to being underground in a burrow, that really increases your sensory field when, you're, when what you're sensing is vibration. And so this takes um, advantage of insects who have an a instinct to climb, and also occasionally flying insects will land on the debris, and they'll come out. How numerous are little? constructions like this? Like, if you walk through the woods, will you see dozens and dozens of Well, it depends. No, well, if you really went looking for them, uh, this, these kinds of spiders, megalomorphs in general, will and mesotheles, actually, if you find one, you'll find more, because they don't go far. They can't disperse, which I'll get to, but they can't disperse very far. How common are they? Not tremendously common, but not uncommon if you're in the right place. So actually, these, which are purse web spiders, apparently, if you know where to look on Cape Cod, I've never seen one, but if you know where to look on Cape Cod, you can find these. Um, you can get the scale of this from this oak leaf here. So this is a sapling. And here is the purse web. So it's essentially a closed silk tube. There's a silk-lined underground burrow. And then what the spider does is hang out in this tube. It's very sensitive to any vibration. So like, for instance, if a beetle crawls up here or a fly lands on here, 
the spider will rush to that space. This is kind of like parchment texture. Plunge its fangs through, grab the prey, bring it inside, you know, rush down into the burrow for safety, and then later it'll come back and knit this, knit this back together. So what you can see is, you know, this looks like things are pro progressing, right? You now have taller trees and flying insects, and the megalomorphs are clearly starting to use silk to reach upward. But what you find out is that's not how evolution works. It's not going in any particular direction. Yep. How long are those? They would be about maybe six inches. Um, this is a more recently evolved megalomorph species, and you see that it's gone back to the burrow with the trap door. Um, you see the silk lining. You see the silk door. Um, and then there are, there are other megalomorphs who make burrows with no doors. There are some who make funnel webs, which are kind of sheets of silk with a little kind of funnel-shaped um, <clears throat> retreat. There are some that make these sort of disorganized but lacy looking sheets. And some of these sheet webs can, they're not adhesive. They can slow down. It would be kind of like walking on a slack trampoline. Um, so they slow down prey. Some can entangle prey, but they're not actually adhesive. Um, but, yeah? So several of these have you know, moving parts, right? And you said yeah. that's the one that kind of tore through the parchment and then just stitched up afterwards. The rest of them, do any of them, since the silk is so complicated, use like a mechanical kind of thing? Or is it just the spider like pushes the door out of the way and yeah. moves? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Later, later evolution, there are some mechanical yeah, things. If you, you yes. <laughs> that, and there's a lot more than that. <laughs> um, but what now, let's see. So what, oh, I know. So what I was going to say is, but you know the very common thing of a spider dropping on a thread? None of these spiders that we've looked at so far can do that because none of them can produce major ampulate silk. And major ampulate silk is that dragline silk. Um, still, even though none of them can do that, you know, there are 90 known species of the mesotheles. There are over 3,000 known species of these, megal these various megalomorphs. Okay, so evolving at around the same time but in a different direction are the bunch of spiders known, the lineage of spiders known as the Araneomorphs. Okay, they can all make this silk that I'm talking about, which is called major ampulate silk. This is the silk that you hear about when you hear about, you know, spider silk being stronger than steel. That's this kind of spider silk. None of this kind of silk is stronger than steel. Um, so, Major, and major ampulate silk, that's what they hang on. That's what allowed spiders to move out into the airspace. So for instance, this is known as a lampshade web. This is made by one of the earliest evolved but still surviving araneomorphs. Um, and what you see here, so this again has been dusted, so it looks a little bit strange. What, so what you can't see is back inside the lampshade, there is a silk mat that's laid down first. Then the spider lay, uh, spins. So arachnologists have their own use of words. Spinning means that the spider uses its legs to pull the silk out of its body. The mesotheles and the megalomorphs will glue down the silk and then walk away from it. The araneomorphs pull the silk out with their legs. So Technically, that's spinning. So it will spin these lines, these major ampulate lines. Because of the tensile strength of the lines, you can see that this, compared to anything you've seen previously, has a lot more space between the lines. And then they guy out the shape in this way. There's, you can't see it, and I'll explain why, but there's like an opposing cone of lines this way. So. But you know, what do you really see here? What you really see is the spider is doing what the earlier evolved spiders did. This is essentially a burrow that's been brought out underground. The spider hides out inside that from its predators. The lines deter its predators. But the biggest advantage and probably the reason leading to the uh, evolution of major ampulate silk is that if things get too hairy with the predator, they can dive out on their safety line. Um, 
So it allows you to, oh, now the, the powder here is adhering to another Araniomorph innovation called Crebellet silk. So the Araniomorph spiders will lay down the major ampullate catching lines, and at the same time, they have a spinning organ called a crebellum um, that emits tiny fibrils of silk. They are so fine that it takes about 4,000 of them to equal a human hair. And as they're laying it down on this line, they use a special comb of hairs on their back legs to kind of tease it back like a Jackie Kennedy bouffant, like this. <laughs> and you end up with these um, waves of silk that are so fine that you get van der Waals forces between, between the silk and the molecules on the exoskeleton of their prey. Um, so that's all pretty innovative. And you can see where that allows spiders to go to. They've created this completely new niche, right? So major ampullate silk, it allows you to drop out of harm's way. That's probably its bigger, biggest benefit. But it also opened up new opportunities, which is that it allows you to hang silk, uh, sorry, hang silk <laughs> across wider gaps. And um, it's very strong. So it allows you to hang heavy webs across those gaps. But the other thing it allows you to do is, uh, you'll know this if you read Charlotte's Web, it also allows you to fly if you're an Araniomorph spiderling. The problem with being a spiderling is that your siblings and you are cannibals. So you want to, <laughs> you want to disperse fairly early. And um, Araniomorphs, spiderlings, disperse. I told you the, the arachnologists have a lot of these technical terms. The technical term for what this spider is doing is called tiptoeing. <laughs> it's um, up. It'll find a high point go on the tips of its legs, and then put its hind end up into the air and start releasing major ampullate silk. And it can actually sense air currents on, its, on the bristles on its body. And eventually, under the right conditions, they'll get enough lift from the silk that they'll be lifted up. You know, some of them, it, uh, some of them will just fail, and they'll go just a couple of feet, and who knows what will happen to them. But there's you know, documented, many, many documented cases of lots of them being whisked way up into the air and going you know, kilometers. Um, you probably know about the explosion on Krakatoa. Um, the, one of the first people to go back to Krakatoa, the place was just baked sterile. But there was a spider there. And that's how a spider, I mean, I'm sure it didn't survive, but that's, <laughs> this is how the spider got there. Um, so, all right, so by now maybe you're thinking, okay, they're making this silk, they're stringing up these webs, so probably we get to the vertical orb web, which I showed you first, but that's not true. Um, because orb webs include that spiral capture silk that I showed you. Most Araniomorphs, the, the majority of Araniomorphs cannot make that capture spiral silk. So instead, they're making webs like this, which is just a sort of radiating web out of a crevice. Funnel web, again, coming out usually of a crevice of some sort. Um, suspended sheet webs. And these are called ray webs. And um, anywhere that you see the powder sticking to them, that's where there's that crebellate silk. The other lines are not catching silks. Um, and they're also making silk constructions like this which we unfortunately don't have these. these. This is the European water spider. Um, they live in ponds, and um, that's just sort of pond weed. And so what they do is they dive down from the surface. They construct a uh, major ampullate silk sheet. Then the silvery stuff on the spider's body, those are air bubbles adhering to their, um, the bristles on their body. So when they go up to the surface, the air sticks to them. Then they swim down, and then they brush the air off and the air under the sheet, and then the air collects up in the sheet. And they keep doing that until they produce essentially a diving bell. And the female will actually lay her eggs in there, and the spiderlings will hatch out in there dry and then swim out. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But then at the same time, you've also got thousands of species, thousands and thousands of species of Araneomorphs that just don't make any web at all. And they've instead, they've gone back to trapdoor burrows, like the wolf spiders, if you're familiar with wolf spiders. Um, they are Araneomorphs, but they live in burrows. The huntsman spiders, which run around. Or, in fact, the most diverse um, spider family of all are the jumping spiders. There are about 5,000 known species of jumping spiders. If you look very, it's hard to see on this, but if you look very carefully, you can see the safety line coming from the back of the, major ampullate safety line coming from the back of the spider. Um, they don't, you know, they don't always hit their target. Probably most of the time they don't hit their target, but they're saved by their major ampulate line. They can also use the major ampulate line to kind of control their direction as they, come, as they come close to their target. So all of these ways of negotiating with the environment uh, are in different ways enabled by major ampulate silk. So not finally, which I'll get to, you have the orb web. But um, all the evidence that we have so far is that orb webs, you know, which we usually think of as being vertical, first evolved as horizontal structures. So you're actually looking down on this. What I've found since doing this book, it really changes your habits. I now have noticed that like next to a lot of utility poles, for some reason there's like an empty steel pole. A lot of times if you look in those, you'll see a horizontal orb web. Um, and what they're doing is they're taking advantage of, of insects hatching out in there and their um, instinct to fly up. Yep? What's the evidence that the horizontal one evolved first? Like I can't see how the fossil record would help you here. You can't tell by the, by the fossil record, but because there are so many living species of spider, you can do all the sort of taxonomy on them. Yeah. So it's a phylogenetic tree. Exactly. Exactly. So, but what's different about this from a vertical orb web is the catching spiral is a different silk protein from the vertical orb webs. And what you see here, the adhesive on it is not adhesive, it's Van der Waals force, it's um, the Crebellet silk, not the sticky glue that we see on the vertical orb webs. Um, so, it seems there's a little bit of an evidence shift at the moment. It's very clear that these evolved um, first. We thought that we think, and most of the evidence at the moment says that the vertical orb webs and the horizontal orb webs have a very recent, that's their most recent common ancestor. <clears throat> it may turn out that um, these are slightly cousins, that it evolved first, but there's a shift and somebody is actually, there's some postulation that, they, that this structure may have evolved and then disappeared and then re-evolved, which like for instance happens with the burrows. So I'll be really interested to see what happens with that. Um, so when we get to the vertical orb web, so this is a piece of um, capture spiral line. Yep. Just, uh, for the horizontal webs, would humans find those sticky? Or because it's only Van der Waals forces, it's the only like, smaller, like, frequent like, the There, It doesn't stick in the same way, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a piece of, vert of uh, vertical, vertical orb web capture spiral in a piece of amber that's uh, 130 million years old. And yeah, so there's the line you can see, and then the the droplets are this protein glue, aggregate silk protein glue. They the spider lays it down in a coat, but because of the chemical uh, makeup of the glue, it beads up like that. So when you see sparkles on the webs, sometimes what you're seeing is water, but a lot of times this is what you're seeing. Um, so the interesting thing about this is, you know, this means that spiders first began to build vertical orb webs back when the dinosaurs were around, which seems like an awfully long time ago, but that's really late in spider evolution. I mean, that's 250 million years into the story of spider evolution. Um, so as I said, these have the qualities that I mentioned of the orb web. The other thing about them is that these are the first spiders to hang their webs out in direct sunlight. And as a result, 
well, not as a result, but associated with that, they have interesting optical qualities. So if we get to Q&A, somebody should ask why insects still fly into these things after 130 million years. Um, <laughs> and the evolution of this new silk correlates with another explosion so in species. So like I said, the mesotheles have about 90 species. The megalomorphs, there are about 3,000 species. The araniomorphs, there are now about 39,000 species. And within the araniomorphs, this section of spiders, if you want to call them that, outnumbers their closest relatives by about 10 to 1. So, so clearly what they've done is that they've gone out, created new niches, they were able to move farther out in branches, and also especially they're, they're catching new prey, which is fast flying insects. Um, so if you were like me before I started working on all of this, um, you know, I kind of had, one of the misconceptions I had was that there are these kind of like acmes of evolution, that the orb web was like this. And I have evidence that I'm not the only one who thought this because there was a cover story about those, you know, the goats that they were trying to get to make spider silk in, um, which they're still working on. There was a cover story in the Times, uh, New Times Magazine in 2001, and part of the story talked about how, you know, spiders used to do all sorts of things, and then they started making the orb web, and the rest of the spiders all disappeared. Clearly not true. <laughs> so, um, but in addition to uh, another piece of proof that there is not an acme of adaptation, I mean, the orb web is pretty amazing, but the cobweb, which most people think is just really kind of a mess, um, in common parlance is more advanced than the orb web. It, 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 it evolved after the cobweb. It derives, I mean the orb web, it derives from the orb web. And the evidence seems to show that it evolved um, through natural selection as a response to the evolution of wasp, spider hunting wasps. Spiders' biggest predators are wasps. It's really a horrible story what, spider, what wasps do to spider, they, spiders. They um, catch them, paralyze them, lay their egg in them, and then the larvae comes out and eats the still living paralyzed spider. Um, yes, exactly. So what you've got here is you've essentially got sort of a silk shark cage. That little orange spot in there is the spider. Do you see it? Um, that's the spider. So it's essentially in this um, shark cage. And then the other interesting feature of these webs is the, it's called a gum foot line, which are these lines coming down. They're glued down here. And obviously, they're under tension. And so what happens is that if prey walks by and severs that glue connection there. They stick to this line and get flung up to the spider. <laughs> um, so in addition to the protective advantage of this, there's also the advantage that they, that they can capture not just flying uh, prey, but also walking prey. So just to kind of sum up all of this and what we've seen here. So as I said, I'm not a biologist, but I've really come to feel that it's more and more important for non-biologists to understand at least the really basic concepts of evolution. I mean, it has a, you know, it has a big understanding in a big impact in how you would do or do not understand global warming. Um, all sorts of ecological questions. I mean, for instance, as you learn this and this scale of this history, you understand that there's really no such thing as a balance of nature. Things are never really in balance. Um, it has Evolutionary concepts have a big uh, impact on biomedical questions, including cancer and the treatment of cancer. Um, and I have come to think that spiders are kind of the vehicle for explaining uh, evolution to non-biologists. So just for instance, I learned that contrary to my gut feelings, uh, natural selection is not some knockout competition like we saw with Brazil and Germany yesterday. <laughs> um, it's, uh, there isn't just one winner. There isn't any ACME adaptation. There is, in fact, no such thing as being perfectly adapted to your environment. I mean, the orb web is really amazing. It doesn't help spiders avoid spider-eating wasps. So everything is much, much more fluid than we tend to perceive. Um, 
orb webs and cobwebs are excellent at catching flying insects, but you know the mesotheles are still fine in their burrows, as though uh, insects never evolved flight. So our ideas of perfect or ideal or advanced or primitive are completely irrelevant to nature. And that has a lot of implications for how we think about ecology. And I haven't even talked about the co-evolution of you know, parasites and um, pathogens. I mean, there, when you get these micro, really uh, you know, intense microscopic views of spiders, you see that spiders have mites and some of those mites have mites. Um, so spiders have made very clear to me that evolution is aimless. There's no goal. If there were a goal, we would have one or two species of spiders and not more than 40,000. And it's not all aiming at the orb web. Um, so I just wanted to say I hope that you've enjoyed this. Um, these concepts, these evolutionary concepts, actually once you get them are quite simple. Um, and once you start paying attention to spider silk, and even though this is an incredibly clean room, I'm sure we could find some here. <laughs> Um, once you start paying attention to spider silk, you start noticing all sorts of things that you would never notice otherwise. So um, if you're interested um, in a little more about how the book came about or some things that you know we didn't manage to get into the book, you can check out my website. And this organization, cpali.org, is my co-author, Kay Craig has started an organization um, in Madagascar based on her knowledge of silk. That's a um, conservation and poverty alleviation program in Madagascar. So thank you very much. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks very much, Leslie. That thank was you. Fantastic, uh, fascinating. Um, I know we started late, but some people will have 2 o'clock meetings. So let's have questions for the next eight minutes, then let people leave without embarrassment. Of course, these are Googlers, so they won't be embarrassed anymore. But, um, <laughs> and then you know, anyone who wants to stay after that, I'm sure, yeah. uh, if you're available. I'm available. Great. Yeah. Yep. Have you, as a result of writing this book, have you developed any kind of more intimate fondness for spiders? Do you keep any spiders as pets now? Um, I don't keep them, but they like my house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't do a lot of housework. <laughs> Yes. So why do insects still fly into the web? Oh, so, right. So there, maybe this isn't the right metaphor to use, but there is this arms race between the development of insect vision systems, which are pretty amazing, and the optical qualities of the, let me see if I can also find you a couple of, uh, I don't know if this will, okay. So for instance, um, Here's, a, here's an orb web. There are reflectance. Um, there are reflectance patterns in the web. Insects can actually learn. There are, there are, there have been, my, my co-author started some of this. There have been experiments that show that flying insects can learn not to fly into webs. If they fly into one, get stuck in escape, which happens a lot, they will, most of them will not fly back into the same web. There are some, she said, that was almost sort of tragically comical, would keep flying back in. But, <laughs> but um, they will learn. But what happens is you can see even to the human eye, and obviously they see differently, a bit differently than we do, as that shifts. They're never, they're never static because the plants that they're on are constantly slightly shifting. And so you get these, the pattern breaks up, and the insects work mainly by pattern recognition. You also get... This is um, the web of a golden orb weaver. This happens to be in Madagascar, but we have these in the south, southern states also. You see how sort of yellow and golden it is. How big is that? Uh, that was really big. That was really big. So the spider itself was in pretty good size. About, not as big as you would think, about that big. Um, so that's golden. Well, you know, a lot of these insects are looking for yellow flowers. Oh. So, <laughs> yep. And then, okay, and then here's another example where there are a lot of um, insects. So you know, <laughs> you know Charlotte and Charlotte's Web wrote in her spiders? Mm -hmm. It wrote in her web. He got, White got that idea because there are lots of spiders that put decorations in their webs. And it's still kind of controversial exactly what those decorations are about. 
um, whether they're um, predator uh, deterrence or prey attraction. Um, but they, that's crebellet. It, it's a cineform silk and sometimes crebellet silk that they're putting on there. There's different UV reflectance. And um, most insects are attracted to UV because there are UV stripes often on plants leading to the flower and also UV will often signal to them open space. So um, in this particular picture, photograph, what she was trying to show is that if you look on the, if you look down here, this is a grass stalk um, and this is a UV photo and the reflectance of these decorations is quite similar to the grass stalk. Um, so there, so there, that's what's going on back and forth between the spiders and the flying insects. Yep. I'm sort of surprised that you would, that people would expect an answer to, is this uh, predator avoidance or prey attraction? It's like, it's something to help the spiders live longer. Right, but it'll be both of those things. But the interesting question is, so there are a couple of interesting questions. One is it's a balance because their prey are arthropods with arthropod vision systems, and their predators are arthropods with arthropod vision systems. So there's this balance between attracting prey and not attracting predators. And so, I mean, there's a long way to go before we figure out what's going on with this. And also, my suspicion, just because there's such a huge, you know, thousands and thousands of these species, it's probably different in different cases, depending on where they are and what the particular environment is. Yep. Um, for, for some animals and insects and so on, uh, the other motivating factor for changes in what they do is reproduction. Mm -hmm. Do spiders also do special stuff with their... Uh, spider sex is... <laughs> so, there are a couple of things about spider sex. First of all, they, nobody has quite figured out why they have evolved. The males, at the front of the spider's body, there are pedipalps, and the males have these modified feet called um, palpal organs. So what they do before they mate, the male spiders go out, they, they go upside down, let's say between a couple of rocks or something, they spin a little web called a sperm web, then they deposit the sperm on the web, then they suck the sperm or draw the sperm up into these palpal organs, and then they go looking for female. And so these palpal organs are what they insert into the female spiders. So now there's also a problem because um, they're also very sexually dimorphic spiders, which means that, the, that there's a big difference in size. The females tend to be giant and the males tend to be tiny. And they tend, this whole idea that the females always eat the male is not true. Again, because there are so many species, there's a huge variety of things that happen. And so these mating practices between different spiders are like all over the place. There's a certain amount of cannibalism. There's a certain amount of, I forget the right term for this, but basically the palps go into the female and then break off which then prevents other males from inserting their palps. There's a, there are um, males who the female will be on her web, and the male will figure out a different pattern of vibrations to put on the web so that she recognizes him as a male and not as prey. So there's, that's a whole other lecture. And actually, I don't re, I'm not an expert in that, but there are people who are. <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, it's almost 2 o'clock. Let's thank uh, Leslie again for coming.